Most of us in this room would probably have to admit that we know very little about sheep, that we've had practically zero experience in the area of sheep herding or sheep shearing or sheep dipping or anything really having to do with sheep, unless you grew up on a farm, and probably some of you did. Our first-hand knowledge of sheep usually begins and ends at the state fair. For these days, sheep are wearing brightly colored spandex outfits to keep them clean before they step into the judge's circle, and who are decidedly more stylish than their counterparts in the pasture. And maybe like me, one of the reasons you go to the sheep barn is to see what they're wearing this year. (laughs) In some ways, sheep are just about as simple as they come. You do not, for example, gaze into the eyes of a sheep and see the wisdom of the ages. They are known to get themselves entangled in brush. They sometimes fall over cliffs. They are decidedly lacking in personal initiative. There is no such thing as an independent or self-made sheep. (laughs) The sheep needs a shepherd to guide it and care for it and sometimes rescue it. As one writer put it, there is nothing sentimental about this relationship. For the sheep, it is a matter of survival. For the shepherd, a matter of economy. But let's give them a little credit. If you know anything about herding sheep, you might know that if you go go behind them and try to herd them like cattle, they will just run around and stand behind you. You might be able to push cows, but you cannot push sheep. And they won't go anywhere that someone else has not already gone first, which is sensible in some sheepish kind of a way. And no wonder a good sheepdog is essential these days. And they really do know the voice of their own shepherd. I read somewhere that even today, in parts of the Middle East, there are shepherds who take their flocks out to the hills each morning to graze and bring them home at night for safety. And during the day, there might be several different flocks grazing in the same pasture. The shepherds don't worry at all about keeping them separated. When it's time to go home, the shepherds just call. Each shepherd has a special call or a whistle and the sheep know which one is theirs. Cartoonists love sheep, and really, why not? Next to a cat, is there another animal that is easier to laugh at or laugh about? One of my favorite sheep cartoons is a picture of a man standing in a field surrounded by sheep. He's wearing a suit and tie and carrying a briefcase, and he's talking to the flock who are listening intently, or appear to be listening intently, as sheep often do, even though they're probably hearing wah, 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 or ba, 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 ba. The caption reads, Your shepherd Louie has retired. I'm Mr. Smathers. I will be your grazing resource coordinator and flock welfare and security manager. (laughs) Sheep are smart enough to know that they don't need a grazing coordinator or a flock welfare and security manager. They need a shepherd, someone who will care for them and not abandon them, someone who is there not because it's their job, but because they love them. Today is the fourth Sunday in Eastertide, also called Good Shepherd Sunday. We usually get one part of this 10th chapter of the Gospel of John as our lectionary reading. It's almost always paired with the 23rd Psalm, which we will hear in the next hymn and also in the pastoral prayer this morning, which is based on the psalm. Some years the Gospel lesson focuses on Jesus as the sheep gate, which is the first part of what is known as the shepherding discourse. Other years we hear the part of the passage where Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they know me. This morning we get what might be called the executive summary I am the good shepherd. The hired hand does not care for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. I know my own and they know me. They listen to my voice. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. When Jesus said there will be one flock and one shepherd, he wasn't asking for applications. The position is filled. And that one shepherd, that one good shepherd, will bring all of them into the sheepfold. Now in the ancient world, the sheepfold, the place where sheep were kept at night for safety, was nothing more than a stone wall, an enclosure of stone walls, with a small entrance where the sheep could be brought in or out. It was probably just wide enough for one sheep, because at night the shepherd would lie down across the opening to keep predators out. 
Sometimes dried nettles were put on top of the walls so that if a wild animal tried to climb the rocks, the nettles would rattle and wake up the shepherd, who probably wasn't sleeping all that soundly anyway. Think about it, in front of, on the ground, in front of stone walls, sheep behind you. What if we were to think about the church as the sheepfold? Once we're inside, it's pretty comfortable. We look around and we see people that we know. We look around and we see people who are very much like us. We are not especially motivated to make room for more sheep. In fact, it's just comfortably crowded inside those stone walls, and more of us would most certainly mean that things would have to change. This morning was the second part of a two-part discussion about hospitality at our adult education forum. And if you've been part of the conversation, you know that hospitality is more than something we do for the sake of growing the church. It's not just sharing what we have, it's sharing who we are. And the challenging part of that is not thinking that in order to get into the sheepfold, you have to be just like us. One flock doesn't mean only one kind of sheep get through the gate. And while hospitality is about more than just growing the church, it is, at one level, about church growth. So let's talk about that for just a minute. If you ask most congregations if church growth is a priority, they will say, yes, absolutely. But there's always that disclaimer. Yes, absolutely, we want to grow. But that's not going to happen unless we can attract young families, so we need to find a young pastor with young children. Yes, absolutely, we want new people. But only if they're like us. A, theologically, B, politically, C, economically, D, other, E, all of the above. We could spend the rest of the morning adding to the yes, but list. The fear always seems to be, what if it works? To which I say, well, wouldn't that be a great problem to have? So what about those yes, buts? Yes, but we're not going to grow unless we can attract young families, so let's find us a young pastor who has young children. And the fatal flaw in that argument is that many churches that rely on the possibility of attracting young families to make the church grow usually don't have enough programs for young families to keep them interested in coming back week after week. And even if they manage to find that perfect young pastor with young children, the odds are that those children are going to be the Sunday school. Fortunately, McAllister Plymouth seems to be on the upswing when it comes to attracting young families, but there's always more we could do to make it more welcoming or easier for them to be part of us. For example, offering child care at all events, including evening meetings and then making sure that those folks with young children know that it's available and will be available on a consistent basis. Or starting meetings earlier than 7 o'clock at night. Wonderfully convenient for those of us who work all day. We have time to go home and have supper and come back about 7. But meetings often go to 8.30 or 9 o'clock, which is way too late for people who are trying to get kids to bed or for people who go to work at 6.30 or 7 or 7.30 in the morning. What if we started meetings earlier, like at 5.30 or 6, and maybe offered supper and child care? The evening wouldn't run as late, and people who are trying to manage children or teenagers might be more inclined to volunteer for a committee or serve on session or the Board of Deacons. What about reviving the idea of offering some kind of parenting education as a parallel track on Sunday morning? or inviting young parents to coffee and conversation in the social hall during the education hour instead of losing them to coffee news on Grand Avenue while their kids are in Sunday school? What about couples without children who don't particularly want to talk about diapers and feeding schedules? What would attract them to greater involvement? If you were at the adult education hour a couple of weeks ago, you heard me say that we need to get out of the ARC mentality. The world does not arrive at our doorstep two by two. And maybe we need to think more intentionally about opportunities for single people to get together. Yes, we want new people, but only if they are like us theologically, politically, economically, whatever. How boring is that? Where would we get the enlivening diversity of opinion, the good discussions, the richness that comes with our being only one strand in that wonderful tapestry of creation? This one means we have to continue to think creatively about inclusiveness. 
Even though we might assume that all of McAllister Plymouth is at one end of the theological or political or economic spectrum, you might want to test that assumption sometime. It may be true that more of us lean a little left, but I suspect there's a sizable group of us in the middle, and maybe even some on the other end of the teeter-totter. Maybe it's time to learn what makes you different from the person you sit next to in the pew week after week. And then think about what we say when we are invited to the communion table. This is the Lord's table. Everyone is welcome. This is God's church. Everybody is welcome. Our job is to welcome the stranger, not to try to make them like us. Again, one flock doesn't mean one flock of all the same kind of sheep. Church growth studies are all in agreement that a very high percentage of people, upwards of 70%, join a church because someone invited them. In a week or so, you will begin to get the results of the congregational survey that we took earlier. There was a question that said, how many of you have invited at least one person to worship in the last year? 60% of those people who responded said none. Someone personally extended an invitation to worship, to a community event happening at the church, to an adult education presentation, to a book group, the women's retreat, to the all-church supper. Someone invited you and you said yes. And the key here is that somebody said, come with me. The risk here is that you have to admit your connection to a faith community, which might lead to your having to talk about your faith. And right now I can hear you saying, I'm not really comfortable talking about my faith. No. Ask yourself, why not? Usually the answer is this. Well, my faith is a private matter. But that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to keep it to ourselves. We're called to share our faith. And how else do we do that than by talking about it and by acting on it? So maybe it's time for us to find ways to begin sharing those faith stories, those faith journeys in safe and respectful ways so that we get used to doing it. We might really surprise ourselves and surprise each other with the depth and the breadth and the beauty of our faith stories. Of course, we know that hospitality and church growth are about more than numbers more than the numbers of us who attend worship or adult education, more than the numbers of us who volunteer, more than the numbers of us who are taken off the rolls each year, more than the number that the sheepfold can comfortably accommodate. Churches grow spiritually when hearts open to new ideas and new people, new mission opportunities, new ministries of care and compassion. Hearts grow when we realize that what we do on Sunday has a tangible effect on what we do on Monday, that we aren't the Rotary Club or the Garden Club, that we live out our faith because that's what we believe Jesus would have us do. The good news is that we don't have to do God's job. One flock, one shepherd. We don't have to take it upon ourselves to lie down in front of the sheepfold every night. Our anxieties about who's in the sheepfold are replaced by the freedom to love whomever we find ourselves with in the flock. It is admittedly a curious kind of freedom, but then human beings are a rather curious kind of flock. It is the freedom that allows us to follow the shepherd out of the sheepfold and into the world to experience the presence, moment-by-moment -moment presence of God and the grace of being part of the beloved flock. Being part of the flock is risky business. Being part of a faith community requires a measure of trust in an institution that we may not believe deserves it. It requires trust in other people, too, which may be riskier for some of us than trusting the institutional church. And yet, unless we are part of the flock, we have no stake in its plans, we have no say in the decision-making, and we have nothing invested in its future. Some things are worth the risk. It's our job as shepherds to create a safe place, to take our cues from the one good shepherd who provides green pastures and still waters, to invite others to the table and be gracious hosts. It's our job as sheep to open ourselves to the possibilities that come with trusting the one who leads us, to respond to the voice of the one who knows us and loves us and wants us to have life and to have it abundantly. Thanks be to God. Amen.